Hello and welcome to This Week in Review with Nigel Farage. Nigel, I'm surprised to discover that you're still at large despite the best efforts of the health secretary's team. Amazing, yes. Um, these leaks, this 100,000 WhatsApp messages uh, that have been given, uh, bracket sold, uh, to the Telegraph uh, from Hancock. He must have been crackers to hand them all over to a journalist, but hey. And, and yeah, I'd come back from America. I'd been back a fortnight. And the pubs were reopening. So I was down in the village at 12 o'clock, yeah, knocking on the door <laughs> to get in for the first proper pie for God knows how long. Anyway, I obviously tweeted out some pictures of it. And had I been back for 14 days, or had I been back for 13 days and 12 hours, because the quarantine rule was 14 days, apparently the day, the, the day you land in the morning back from the States, that doesn't count. So I was in breach. All right. Amazing. Sir Ed Davey, the Lib Dem leader, wrote to Kent Police demanding action. And Hancock team called me a pub hooligan, which, by the way, I've now taken as my Twitter handle. And and they were actually disgusting. Shall we get in touch with the Home Office? Shall we lock him up? This all goes to show when you give people too much power, which we did via the Coronavirus Act, when you make people like Hancock have the powers of a medieval king, there's only one thing they'll ever do with it, and that is to abuse it. It then turned out a few days later that Witty and Valance, the two medicos, thought seven days was plenty. In fact, five days was fine. But Hancock said, no, we've got to keep 14. Otherwise, it'll look like we were wrong. And so you realise this cobblers we were told about following the science had not much to do with it. It was all about Hancock looking good as he climbed the pole to become the next Prime Minister. I mean, what a ghastly little man. And I don't want little pipsqueaks like Hancock telling me how to live my life. I tell you what, they try and lock us down again, I'd ignore it from day one. Yeah, so on behalf of, of people who follow you and support you, I think you dealt with this perfectly on GB News that what I gather was was quite short notice. So well done, done on that. I want to ask you, though, whether there's a more serious side to this. If the government had targeted a journalist, and I don't know what to, to what extent you consider yourself a journalist or, or a politician, I don't know what you when you consider yourself a politician anymore, this would have been quite nefarious, wouldn't it? Using, you know, an arbitrary rule like that to, to lock wow. up someone who's supposed to be holding, you know, the government to account, which I think you'd do better than any journalist or politician, but you get the idea, right? It's quite nefarious. Uh, whether, you, whether you classify me as a politician or a journalist isn't relevant. The relevance is, the relevance is that by that stage of the pandemic, I was becoming very questioning of what we were doing, of why we were doing it. I was beginning to ask questions about the booster, whether it really was necessary or not. So I was an opponent. This was an attempt to abuse the judicial process to get rid of somebody who is an opponent. I mean, this is the stuff of, 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 of Banana Republic. So yes, it is very sinister. Um, I'm told the Telegraph have got enough stuff to last for three months. Um, by the end of which... Well, I tell you what, though, we're going to learn more in the Telegraph than we'll ever learn from any official government inquiry, right. on which, by the way, they've spent 85 million quid already and not interviewed a single minister. Not a single minister has yet given any testimony. So whatever the ethics of getting rid of stuff that you're supposed to have privately, the fact is that uh, these leaks are doing us a national service and making us realise just how appalling many of our leaders are. I'm surprised and disappointed that anyone's surprised and disappointed about any of this, because it seems to me that it's not surprising or disappointing. It's exactly what I would have expected. So how surprised are you by what's come out? Um, I'm surprised at just how political those decisions were. I would have thought that the medicos would have had the whip hand on those decisions, it turns out, actually, they didn't. That's the surprise. Yeah, it seems to me that over the last few months, people have been saying, well, politicians should have been in charge because the scientists didn't understand a wide enough to, you know, understanding of what the pandemic was about. They didn't understand the consequences of lockdowns, for example, for the economy and so on and so forth. And it seems to me that view has now been proven a little bit wrong uh, because, quite frankly, the politicians were in charge and they weren't following the science and they were following politics. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. The politicians were in charge. 
You could argue they should have been in charge, but they did it very badly. One of the things that you've been saying for a long time now on Question of Freedom is that China is the story that everyone should be talking about and hasn't been. And I was reading today that a big part of what's going on and was going on during the pandemic in terms of the policy decisions was a fear of upsetting China. Uh, and then Isabel Oakshot wrote about this in the Telegraph today. Are you worried that one of the reasons the response to COVID was so bad was because of this fear of upsetting China and blaming China? And whether that's going to change now that this Wuhan origins story is, is gaining more and more credibility? Look, you know, Donald Trump was right from the start. He called it the China virus. They all said that was racist and wrong. The fact is the lab was there in Wuhan. The lab had been funded by the Americans. It had been funded by the European Union. And indeed, some of the big pharma companies were involved as well. Um, and you see from the leaks today that basically the civil service were telling ministers, don't say this, don't write that. We don't want to upset China. And it shows the extent to which our establishment has effectively been bought and paid for by China. It is unsurprising. Oh, and of course, the biggest sign of fire of the lot, Stanley Johnson, who, by the way, is off to China very shortly to make a film about what I've no doubt what a wonderful country it is, um, is now up for a knighthood. And you look at the board of Huawei, the non-exec directors over the last few years, you see the former boss of BP, uh, former senior civil servants, former politicians. Uh, the Chinese are very, very good at bribing the British establishment. And this is worrying, because however bad things may be in Bahamut and elsewhere, you know, the biggest threat to us is China. And yet, many of the upper echelons want no debate about it at all. Trump is now calling for huge compensation uh, from China. I, I doubt we'll get it. But I tell you what, though, we could do with the truth, couldn't we? I agree, but I'm not as skeptical about the idea of compensation. Jim Rickards, who we both follow, has been saying that actually it is plausible that there will be uh, some sort of compensation made, even if it is only to the extent of defaulting on, for example, government debts held in China, which is an interesting idea that could cause a lot of uh, geopolitical problems. Yeah. But let's move on uh, to the story about coal being needed to back up the electricity grid. And this is with renewables only being that much of the grid, let alone 100% of it. What do you make of this story that we do still need coal as the backup? The end of coal. That's what Boris told COP26, the end of coal. Well, actually, Mr. Johnson, the worldwide estimate for 2023 is the world will, will burn 8 billion tonnes of coal this year. 8 billion tonnes of coal. And of course, we're talking Indonesia, we're talking India and China predominantly. Um, yeah, as predicted, um, our massive investment in renewables, the massive subsidy put on our bills over the last 20 years, when the wind doesn't blow and it gets cold, doesn't work. So yes, in Burton on Trent this week, we fired up a coal-fired power station. Now, we shouldn't have needed to do that because we should be using gas. That should be our backup because you can turn the tap on, you can turn the tap off. It's really easy. In carbon terms, if that's what worries you, Gas is massively more efficient than coal. And yet, we haven't fracked a single barrel of onshore natural gas. Not one single barrel. And yet we know that the Bolan Shale Reserve has got enough gas for us to be self-sufficient for the next half a century. So this is a direct failure of government policy. And interesting how quiet everyone's been about the setting, about, you know, the firing up of a coal-fired power station. He's barely made the news. And yet it's what's happened. Meanwhile, the North Sea oil producer Harbour Energy has claimed that its profit was completely, almost completely wiped out by the these taxes that are specifically designed to, to discourage the super profits that they're staying. Um, it seems to me that governments are, on the one hand, actively discouraging the use of coal and gas and so on and so forth. And on the other hand, they're sort of relying on it by the back door. And that gap's got to close somehow at some point. Either they both start encouraging um, oil and gas and coal so they have these backups available, or they've got to probably shut them down, and in which case we would have had the blackout. It, so yeah. which of the two are they going to be? It's a mess. I mean, Harbour Energy, their argument's very simple. You put a windfall tax on now. So if they invest money in the North Sea in extraction projects and make a profit... 
75% of it goes in tax. If they invest money in the North Sea on exploration and fail and lose money, they take 100% of the loss. Where is the incentive for anyone like Harbour Energy? And we all think of Shell and BP and the Giants, but there were lots of other companies like Harbour Energy involved in this industry. And, you know, the message is don't bother. And we've also seen Shell now completely rethinking their long-term investment plans. So all we're really doing, all we're really doing is making ourselves yet more dependent on imports of energy from abroad and probably going to put ourselves in a position, ironically, where we might need to fire up more than one coal-fired power station. I mean, the whole thing is crackers. It's the budget next Wednesday. Um, all sorts of pressure now being put on the Chancellor and coming from not the usual suspects, coming from the CBI, coming um, overnight legal and general. Uh, we've had Sir James Dyson. Uh, many people saying you're making the business atmosphere so negative in Britain for investment. Companies aren't coming in. Corporation tax is rising too much. Tax write-downs on investments. Well, we'll see what he does next week. Um, but that expires at the end of this month. Is it going to come back in? Will he drag it out a further six months? And companies like Arm, you know, now deciding to list on the New York Stock Exchange, not the London Stock Exchange. These are terrible signals, terrible, terrible signals of what's now become a low growth and low productivity economy. And if we're going to turn that around and move to a growth agenda, it has to be through investment. I, I really think they've got themselves into the most awful mess. Maybe we're in for a surprise next Wednesday. Maybe the sheer level of lobbying will convince the Chancellor not to put up corporation tax. But I think it actually works out as a 32% rise in corporation tax. So let's see what happens. But, but be in no doubt that in terms of signals uh, that will have an effect on sterling, Will have, an effect, will have an effect on interest rates and everything else um, next Wednesday. Next Wednesday's budget suddenly becomes very, very important. Any news you want to share from your trip to CPAC in America? Only that Donald Trump is going to win the nomination for the Republican Party. Whether you agree with that or disagree with that, he is going to win. Um, DeSantis, clearly, a very talented fella, uh, a general feeling that he lacks enough experience as yet of life in general. Um, and Trump was admitting on the stage, he said, when I went into the White House, you know, I just, did, I just didn't know what I was doing in Washington. I was out of my desk completely. I'm ready this time. Um, and kind of a lot of people said, well, actually, you know, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be better if DeSantis was part of an administration before running for the top job? So, yeah, Trump, uh, very fiery, um, as controversial as ever. I mean, the line, I am your voice, I am your warrior. I am your retribution. I mean, I mean it's, straight, it's straight out of Hollywood, you know. Um, so, yeah, and I think a general feeling that although people vote on very tribal lines in America, um, I think the Republicans are feeling quite optimistic about next year. Sounds good to you. We'll see what happens. Thanks for joining us and to everyone home. Thanks for watching.